All right, well, we can formally begin. Good afternoon, it's uh, Joe Cressy here. Uh, the committee secretary has confirmed that we have quorum, so I can formally call meeting six of the Toronto Music Advisory Committee to order. Welcome everybody to these strange and weird and hard times that we're all living through and working in. Uh, this meeting is being held using the city's WebEx technology uh, with members of staff and of the committee connecting by video conference. Uh, because we're meeting remotely, we ask, of course, for your patience with any delays and technical issues. I know some members of the committee are, are still waiting for updated links to come to you, so those are on their way. Uh, as City Hall remains closed, uh, the public can continue to participate electronically, and, and this meeting is streaming on YouTube at youtube.com slash Toronto City Council Live. Uh, we do have, as, there's three items on the agenda which we'll come to, and there's presentations for each of them. Uh, just to note that we also have three registered public speakers, two on the first item and one on the second. Uh, all the registered speakers have been connected and will be speaking to us uh, by phone, by audio. Uh, if you're wondering, the list of speakers can be viewed online at the committee's webpage at toronto.ca slash council, uh, and you can click the speakers box for the, the list of registered speakers. Uh, of course, we've all got used to these virtual meetings, so this doesn't need to be said, but I'll say it. Uh, just if folks could keep their mics muted and their videos on, uh, that'll make it a little bit easier for us. Uh, when we go through the items, I'll go for a show of hands and, you know, we'll We'll make all this work, we've done it before. Um, so although we are in different locations and meeting remotely, uh, TMAC acknowledges the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas, the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, let me begin as we formally dive in here. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Uh, if you have an interest, uh, if you could unmute your mic to make that known. Okay, seeing none. Uh, could I ask for a motion to formally confirm the minutes from our last meetings in, in February and May? Uh, moved by... Uh, Mary Ann, thank you very much. All those in favor, by a show of hands, confirming the minutes opposed, if any, that carries. Okay, so there are three items on the agenda. Uh, item uh, 6.1, support for artists, 6.2, uh, impacts on live music venues, and 6.3 on the nighttime economy. Uh, we do have presentations on each, so we can dive right in here. Uh, and so we're gonna start with item 6.1, which is current conditions for artists and musicians. There's gonna be a brief presentation from Mike, uh, Mike Tanner, of course, that is. Uh, and then we're gonna hear Charlotte and Aaron from our committee, I believe, we're also going to, to give a bit of an overview and then we'll open up for a discussion. Um, if you haven't already, a lot of hard work has gone in in advance of this to come up with some potential recommendations uh, for these items. And so if you, if you haven't, take a look at those. They were emailed around again this morning uh, by Mike and a lot of your feedback has gone into developing those, uh, but just make sure you have those handy. Uh, so Mike, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Um, I imagine you're downstairs from me. I actually don't know where you are. We may be in the same building. So I'll turn it over to you, Mike, to do an overview, and then we have Charlotte and Aaron. We'll turn it over to you guys. Uh, th thanks, Joe. And, and actually, no, I'm in the uh, music office, corporate head office uh, in, over in Riverdale here, uh, as I've been basically since March. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good to see um, see so many faces. Uh, look forward to the time when we can get together again uh, in person. Um, I'm going to be speaking very briefly here, um, just to sort of set the general uh, lay of the land on how the pandemic has uh, affected artists. And then, as Joe says, we're going to hear from two of the artists uh, themselves on, on our committee, uh, Charlotte and, and Aaron, who will speak from their own insight and, and you know, those uh, other artists who they're in touch with. So um clerks have got the uh, presentation up on the screen which is great thank you very much um next slide please we can jump right into this so obviously uh the pandemic has affected everybody in the entire music ecosystem none more so than uh musicians performing artists um while venues remain closed as they have done since uh the middle of march 
and festivals have been canceled or postponed. Uh, all touring is on hold. Uh, all of the income, uh, direct or passive, that artists would generate through these sources is uh, completely decimated. And, and it's worth pointing out here that um, not only do artists make um, revenue uh, in the moment uh, on the nights that they perform at any of uh, you know venues or festivals, any touring that they might do, but that's also the primary method by which artists build and sustain and engage their audience for other kinds of benefits, be they monetary or other word, otherwise, you know, merch sales, music sales, uh, career trajectory, all of that stuff. So uh, everything is is frozen and continues to be frozen. Um, of course, we've all seen a lot of live streams. I'm sure everybody on this committee has been just like me watching particularly in the early weeks of the pandemic, uh, a lot of uh, performances via via screens of different sort. Uh, there was a little bit of a, uh, maybe a downturn of that as the weather was, uh, you know, uh, much better during the summer. It'd be interesting to see where live streaming goes as we move into the fall and into the winter. Um, we suspect it's probably going to be a big part of uh, our entertainment picture for the foreseeable future. But despite... Um, some of the very innovative things that some of our local venues are now starting to do with with uh, limited or no audience live stream shows and gated live streams as you know, offered by side door and other um, other organizations I, I think we can say that live streaming doesn't even begin to uh, marginally compensate for uh, income made uh, from actual live performances for our artists um, those musicians uh, who generate income through composing for film or television have also been affected during the pandemic as we see uh, the general slowdown of film locally that's starting to creep back a little bit but of course there are no um, foreign productions working in Toronto and and film sector generally uh, remains uh, depressed and and with with a sort of concomitant knock-on effect for for anybody who's um, in, in music working alongside film thanks next slide please So looking at the government support uh, that's been rolled out to support artists during the pandemic, uh, there were some early emergency relief programs, such as the one uh, Toronto Arts Foundation uh, and City of Toronto partnered on, the COVID Relief Fund. Uh, that one and others were intended really for triage in the early uh, days of the pandemic. Um, most of them have wrapped up. Um, having served their purpose and having dispersed all the funds that they had available to them, which leaves us to look at uh, Canada Emergency Response Benefits, CERB, um, which is meant to wind up next week, September 27th, during which time everybody is supposed to transition to EI if they're eligible. For those such as self-employed artists who are not eligible for CERB, there are other programs planned such as something called Canada Recovery Benefit, um, which will cover uh, self-employed workers. But please note, there's a maximum weekly payment there suggested of $400 versus $500 from CERB um, and a maximum eligibility of, of 26 weeks. So um, it, it's, it's not a panacea by any means. Um, other government funding has, you know, uh, underwritten some of the costs for the infrastructure, Canada Emergency Wage Subsidies, uh, CEWS, the Canada Emergency Support Fund, um, both of which help the infrastructure, be they venues or uh, music businesses of different kinds. Um, we were under the impression until the throne speech yesterday that CEWS was uh, being slowly phased out this fall through uh, December with lower funding, uh, inc incrementally lower funding levels uh, throughout that time. But there's indication from the throne speech yesterday that um, the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy could be extended through summer 2021. Of course, that's not confirmed yet. Um, the bottom point on the slide here uh, just points out that so many of the programs that Canadian Heritage supports through uh, Factor, for example, uh, is for activities that uh, are not currently operational, touring, showcasing, uh, things of that nature. So uh, of everything that's been rolled out, really the only one that individual artists can access is the CERB program. Next slide, please. So there's been some additional supports offered um, really in the uh, areas of triage and emergency support. Of course, we all know the great work that Unison Benevolent Fund has done and continues to do. There's also the SOCAN Relief Fund and the Ontario Arts Council Arts Response Initiative. All of those are still operating. All of them, the door is still open, as it were. But clearly, they're not 
the kinds of things that an artist can build a budget or a, a you know a future around it they're really meant uh, for for crises only and and i understanding everybody's in a crisis to one degree or another right now but but this is not um this is not something that's that's sustainable next slide please so uh joe mentioned uh, that there are already um motions uh, that have been uh, drafted for your um for you to look at um tmac involvement here really along aligns with assisting and developing some of the recommendations such as advocacy with the government of canada for adequate financial support to continue for self-employed and gig workers extending cews support so that it really sustains the infrastructure and then the second point here where we're talking about um looking at, at what tmac can advocate or recommend the city of toronto do um Further online resources to artists, we have at toronto.ca slash music, our music office page, a lot of resources already available. There's a full music industry directory. There's an artist directory with around a thousand artists um, and, and, and other resources for the industry generally. But there's been discussion at TMAC meetings in the past of fleshing all of that out so that there's uh, job boards and career development advice and other resources for individual artists. And we're very happy to um, explore that and engage with TMAC on fleshing out what's available online through the music office. But this is where we would actually be looking for some um, involvement from TMAC members individually in terms of uh, creating and helping us curate some of the content and keeping it fresh and all of that. So, so that's a discussion to be had for the future, um, and and you know it, it it will show up as one of the potential uh, recommendations um, for for this item. So. With that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Charlotte Cornfield and then Aaron Fogel, and we can come back and answer any questions and comments that you might have. So thanks for that, and over to the uh, real artists among us. Charlotte, uh, you're up. Thank you very much, Mike. So, yeah, I just basically wanted to echo some of the things that Mike was talking about and sort of, yeah, talk about where, as an artist, uh, as a musician in the city I met, and, and some of the people who have spoken to as well obviously there is a lot of um fear and uncertainty around how things are going to look and um yeah so i just wanted to talk about some of the concerns that have been brought to me by members of the community one is just the prohibitive cost of living in the city specifically with regards to housing and many people who have um been on serb just reaching a point where they're just scraping by paying their rents and nothing more and don't see a long-term future in the city. And so many musicians who I know have started leaving, moving to places that are more affordable. And that's really sad because we're losing like key members of our artistic community and strong music community in the city. Um, another concern is that um, now that there are limited sources of funding and everyone's applying for them. There's, yeah, there's just not as many. Yeah, there's like an overload of this sort of grant and funding systems. So that's a concern. Um, I spoke to some musicians who are parents who have been just having a really hard time um, finding any time to work on their artistic craft while they've been um, taking care of their kids this whole time. They're, they're afraid of another lockdown. And of course, like a period of artistic stagnation kind of slows down the whole thing, um, slows down the cycle of making a record or being able to create something. So um, that's a big one. Uh, a lot of grief and mental health struggles that people are um, dealing with without uh, access to supports. Um, Entering winter without uh, that that important summer festival income is yeah scary for people, especially transitioning off Serb. Um, and yeah, I spoke to some people who had lost a lot of money on U.S. visas that are no they you know they had spent like thousands of dollars getting U.S. visas so that they could go make some money and tour in the United States, and now. Um, those visas are null and void. So it's basically, yeah, just another example of some lost income. Um, so with that, what Mike was saying, I think just for basic sort of 
survival, I think advocating um, for uh, things like basic income um, is really important right now. And just, yeah, ways that people can scrape by. Um, and also just access to resources. I have had, I really wanted to see, especially with regards to Toronto, everything in one place. So what Mike was saying, I would be happy to help to aggregate information on one link and then spread that around. Um, about, yeah, transitioning off of CERB and onto CRB, what that means, eligibility, things like that. Um, resources that are available in this city and outside of the city and all the sort of levels of funding that people can access. Um, and then I just had one more thing to say before uh, turning it over to Aaron. Um, I have a suggestion, um, an idea from Simone Schmidt that they asked me to bring forward. Um, they said, the city is spending 6,000 bucks on shelter hotel beds in neighborhoods that are very far from services. Um, and they suggested that this is a break that could be um, offered to venues so that people could potentially live in them. Um, and it kind of gets two birds with one stone, um, getting venues some funding, getting people off the street as the city has lost between 835 and uh, 1,250 shelter spaces due to COVID. Um, and there is a demand for space. I thought that was a really cool idea. And I told them I would bring that forward. So, um, yeah, that's that. And I'll turn it over to you, Aaron. Thank you, Charlotte um, and Mike. Um, a lot of the information that I collected and sort of from my own brain as well as just like um, crowdsourcing information from music community people that I know online already reiterates a lot of what uh, Mike and Charlotte were saying, especially around um, affordability of housing. A lot of people have already had to move out of the city. Um, I, I think it is important to keep trying to advocate for eviction bans um, as long as things are in an uncertain state because um, otherwise we're going to continue to lose uh, people from our artistic community. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, from my perspective, it's also really important to advocate to make sure that arts funding isn't cut in future years um, as a way to sort of make up for budget losses that inevitably happened this year through the emergency supports from the government. Um, I think that a lot of artists make their income by uh, working with arts presenters that receive funding from, you know, Toronto Arts Council, like the different arts councils, as well as um, some of the different funding supports that are available, like SOCAN, Ontario Creates and stuff. So if that funding is cut moving forward, um, we're creating further difficulties in generating revenue for artists as well as all of the careers that um, are integral to the actual performance, such as like uh, venue techs and bookers and agents and managers and uh, the way everyone's presented connected. Um, Someone raised an interesting point to me as well about cutting red tape moving forward for new spaces that are going to be opening and licensed. Um, I think that it is, we've already seen the loss of several of our venues and um, we know it's imperative to protect the ones that are still here. And there's a hope that uh, when live shows can return with some sense of you know, more fullness or greater attendance um, that hopefully we'll see an opening of new venues and we want to make that as easy and accessible for new venue owners as possible. There was also an interesting idea to prepare outdoor spaces for next spring and summer um, to create something that's uh, easy to curate outside because we all know that that's something that um, fits a lot more with the safety protocol, maybe allows for larger audience sizes. So if there's an opportunity 
in some of the parks or outdoor spaces around the city to have um, stage set up or, you know, sound systems or bathrooms or production area for people to easily be able to program in outdoor spaces. I think that that can really help because um, if things are similar to where they are now with our indoor venues, the capacities remain really small. Um, I think there was also a mention to create a database or some kind of resource where job postings are easy to access that are relevant to artists and arts workers as a kind of, in the meantime, experience for people who are just looking for the work right now. Um, the only things that I really know about are working culture and LinkedIn, but I'm not too familiar with either of those, especially as they pertain to people specifically in the arts community. Um, and my last point was also to reiterate what Charlotte just mentioned, um, that is Simone's proposal to uh, use live music venues as housing space for people who are unhoused right now. I think that it's really a brilliant idea because um, if the city is hopefully intending to invest money in finding housing space, especially moving into winter, um, we might as well invest that money in the venues that we're also trying to save. Um, and I see it as kind of a perfect circle because by the time uh, those venues are ready to open with greater capacity, then we may be in a space that's safer for people to be re-entering shelters without needing social distancing. Um, so I think that that's a really unique and important idea for us to be pushing for. And I also wanted to mention that there's an organization that I'm sure many of you are familiar with at this point called ESN, which is the Encampment Support Network. And um, this is a completely volunteer, democratically run organization that is essentially supporting people who are unhoused right now, who have been living in the different encampment sites around the city. Almost every single arts worker that I know is volunteering for ESN right now, some of them like full time. So I think that there is also an interesting opportunity if there is um, funding that can be put towards ESN and towards supporting the unhoused community, that this is also a creation of jobs for people in the music community who are already working, um, but there's just not any uh, resource or funding coming through for them. So I think that that would be a really interesting thing to consider as well. That's all I had. So thank you. That's, that's excellent. Thank you, Mike, Charlotte, and Aaron. What we'll do here, we, we do have two registered speakers for this item. So we'll, we'll hear from the speakers first. And again, members of the committee will have a chance to ask them questions. And then we'll bring it back into committee. Um, so uh, and, and that way, um, comments and feedback from our speakers can help to inform our own discussion as well. So we want to make sure we hear from them first. Uh, I have Rhea from uh, the Toronto Musicians Association. Do we have you on the line, Rhea? Uh, hopefully, yes. Yeah, we hear you loud and clear. Uh, so, Rhea, it, uh, we're going to turn the floor over to you. Uh, you, uh, you theoretically have five minutes. You know, I'm, I'll watch your clock, but I won't be too hard on this, of course. So, whenever you're ready, you can start. Oh, that's great. Thanks very much uh, to the committee for accepting the request from the Toronto Musicians Association to address you today. The TMA, uh, as you probably know, is the largest of 13 locals in Ontario, and we represent approximately 3,000 members. Today, I'm actually speaking on behalf of our executive director, Michael Murray. I have been a board member at the TMA for about eight years and I've been on multiple committees. The TMA uh, continues to advocate on behalf of our members and for the arts and community, music community as a whole. And we recently have proposed several new initiatives. You will have received a one page document. And the same document is also posted with hyperlinks if you would uh, like that uh, at a later time. Um, Okay, the first is the Save Live Arts, um, which you're very aware of. The TMA has been very involved in this initiative. For this petition, the TMA proposed a property tax reduction 
to owners and operators of live arts venues. And we're very pleased to see that this happened. And you have mentioned venues today. So we would like to acknowledge the efforts of those who made this happen. And we look forward to the venues continuing uh, to recover and also to improving the fees and the working conditions for all the artists during COVID and beyond. The Artists for Basic Income that was mentioned today, yes, the TMA continues to support this initiative and we joined over 30 organizations representing about 75,000 artists in a request to Prime Minister Trudeau uh, to establish this basic income guarantee for our artists. The TMA is also proposing a new initiative, it's a tax credit that would support live performance. We submitted a study and a proposal to Ontario's Provincial Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs and sent a letter to the Honourable Lisa McLeod, who's the um, Ontario Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture. The TMA is asking that the Government of Ontario introduce a live arts labour tax credit and a live arts labour rebate to organizations that have live music in order to help offset their labor expenditures for live productions that are produced by Ontario-based Canadian organizations. The province of Ontario currently has invested in 2018 about $750 million in tax credits for Ontario culture media. Um, and largely these went to screen-based productions such as film and TV, which is great, but none of that funding was directed to live arts. So the TMA is requesting that the provincial government develop incentives to hire Ontario musicians under this current Ontario Culture Media Tax Credit program so that it can expand from the screen base to include live music. The next item is the Stage 3 Reopening Rules and Request for Change. The TMA is advocating for a socially restricted concert model through proposed amendments to the Stage 3 guidelines. The TMA is proposing what we're referring to at the moment as listening concerts, where there's limited social interaction, so limited speaking and introductions at the beginning limited alcohol availability, and also a limited time. So the concert is only the duration that it takes to perform the music, so there wouldn't be any intermission. The TMA reiterates mandatory masks for performers and audiences, and where performers cannot wear a mask, such as wind players and singers, we're asking for physical distancing or a plastic barrier in between musicians and to protect those around them. So it's with these additional protective restrictions in place that we propose an increase in capacity of attendance to 30% of the house, similar to the religious services. The context is the TMA is expecting about a 15 to $20 million loss in scale wages for this year if the gatherings for large events continue to be prevented and the American-Canadian border continues to be closed and we expect that that likely will happen. And lastly, I'd like to mention that the TMA has benevolent funds for its members who are unable to work due to long-term illness. We can provide up to 24 weeks of modest financial assistance. And actually our benevolent funds are going to be featured in the October issue of International Musician, which is the official publication of the American Federation of Musicians of the United States and Canada, with the hope that other locals will adopt and adapt our model that we launched actually in January, just before COVID-19, so the time is very relevant, with uh, amalgamating and revitalizing the three funds that we have, it was basically it was an eight-year project start to finish, and so we're very pleased with this, and we always hope that our members don't need these because they would be experiencing long-term illness, but it's there if needed. And lastly, the team, I would just like to thank this committee for all the work that it does, including its advocacy. It is greatly appreciated and uh, we wish you the best and, and look forward to working with you. Uh, thank thank you. Uh, thanks, Raya. Um, I'm going to open it up. If there are members of the committee who have questions for Raya, do you want to just raise your hand and I'll turn it over to you? 
Okay, seeing, seeing none. Ray, I just had one. You mentioned, is the position of the TMA that we should, that the government of Canada should be exploring a universal basic income as as a ongoing post-COVID support for, for musicians and people writ large? Did I hear that correctly? Yes, yes we do. The case for uh, basic income for the arts or a part there of a universal basic income. But yes, we do support that. And we did start with over 30 organizations. Okay, thank you. That, that's, that's it from me. Um, any, anybody else? You... Okay, Rhea, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, and then next up, I think we have on the line Lisa from, from Phoenix. Do we have Lisa? I'm here. Great. Lisa, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, you'll have again, you know, five minutes and whenever you're ready, you can get started. Okay. Uh, well, thanks everybody. I think I recognize most of your faces uh, and uh, nice to see you, those who are on video. Um, uh, something a little bit more specific and it touches a little bit on what Aaron and uh, Shari's recommendations are. Uh, I'm owner-operator of the Phoenix Concert Theater, uh, as well as the Bronson and Ottawa, uh, uh, both for the most part closed, um, working to change that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, those of you who have been to the venue, and I assume that's most of you, uh, are probably aware that beside us is a medical center uh, that would be about 22,000 square feet, so slightly larger uh, than, than the Phoenix at 18,000 square feet. And uh, that space is actually going to be vacated by the Medical Center. It was originally going to be earlier this year. It is now December of 2020, where they'll be moving up to a space on Wellesley, uh, vacating what is effectively uh, four floors of a medical center right now, with a lot of common spaces that in its current use would include waiting rooms, uh, uh, lunch rooms for staff, uh, as, uh, but also with over 30 uh, office spaces over the, uh, the three floors. Um, we have first right of negotiation, I guess you could say, with the landlord. And I just want to make everybody aware that what we're trying to work towards here, if we can make it work, uh, is something that uh, models itself a little bit after I see Rob's on the call. So Coalition's Great Space up at um, Lawrence uh, Art Space, uh, Akin on the uh, visual arts side, um, and you know on a, a much more premium level spaces like WeWork that can ultimately. Our goal, I guess our, our dream, is ultimately to turn in the space, to turn the space into a, a collective music hub um, for the music community that may even include uh, some limited uh, residences uh, inside the space, as Charlotte and Aaron uh, mentioned the need for that, but also would create economical space for uh, artists to work and create of, uh, create out of particularly, or a space if they are under quarantine that they can go to and, and as you mentioned, Charlotte, um, you know, can complete uh, their work uninterrupted, uh, uh, but also look to uh, space like spaces or we work for the small companies, the small labels, the uh, small agencies, promoters that may have even had a lease uh, prior to this but had to give up the lease, have been working remotely, may continue to work remotely for some time, but just need uh, uh, occasional meeting space uh, to come together with, you know, their, their group, their team, their artists, uh, and, you know, have a common space that, you know, everybody uh, within the building um, is uh, you know, from some part of the music sector, obviously being right beside the Phoenix once we're open is, you know, also creates, uh, you know, a, a nice sort of intercept in terms of uh, using the Phoenix for potential showcase space, performance space, streaming space, etc. Um, 
This is a big vision. We don't, you know, have a huge amount of, of time to, to get in our first freedom negotiation. Uh, and it is a very large space. So, uh, you know, overall, it's, it's uh, not an inexpensive lease, but considering it's right downtown, um, it is something that would be, that is much more economical uh, in terms of these sorts of spaces downtown. Uh, and, you know, ideally we could therefore um, carry forth rates to the artist community, the music community that were comparably, uh, you know, less than kind of market rate, uh, you know, in terms of, of recording space or uh, writing space, etc. cetera. Uh, we are... Uh, have just gone to work on this. Mike Tanner, as always, has been a huge help in terms of introducing me to other groups. I don't know if you guys are interested uh, or are aware of Akin, uh, which does something similar for visual artists. They now have six buildings through the city and rent out space as small as 250 square feet. So visual artists actually have a place uh, to work that's suitable and and you know has the uh, gives them the opportunity to uh, share in creativity with 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 like artists. So uh, I did hear and I had a conversation with Marianne as well about the fact that there had been some TMAC discussion about uh, you know some form of uh, downtown music hub. Just want to let you know that it's something I'm working on. If anybody had any insight, feedback, uh, you know, we're just at the point of looking at the plans and, and trying to figure out how this could work best and and how to help with funding um, because it's certainly something that's more expensive than something I could handle on my own. Um, but, you know, anybody who sort of shares a similar vision or ideas, uh, I think uh, definitely... Mike Tanner has all my coordinates, and I'd love to hear from you. Excellent. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I'm just going to open it up. Uh, again, anybody have any questions for, for Lisa? Uh, if you do, if you want to just raise your hand and get, indicate so. OK, seeing none, Lisa, thank you. Um, and I, I know we'll be chatting, hearing Thanks, from you yeah. again in a minute on, on the venues item. So. We'll then move that this formally. This is back into committee. So want to open it up. Um, either questions for for Mike, uh, but frankly also for for Charlotte and Aaron. Uh, so any questions uh, or any any comments and thoughts. Uh, and I'll look around the room again. If if you're looking to speak, if you want to raise your hand, and I'll call on you. Hi, uh, anybody? Okay. Um, so I'm happy to, to kick it off. I did oh. try and raise my hand, but it doesn't seem to be working. Oh, who's that? <laughs> Marianne. <laughs> oh, hey, Marianne, go ahead. Sorry, I just also um, and you know wanted to build off um, just quickly something that came out in what Lisa was saying and came out in both what Charlotte and Aaron are saying that even though this is positioned as support for artists, that um, that a lot of other cultural workers are being very much impacted. And those people also create income for artists, those people being um, people at small labels, people at festivals, um, and, and, you know, that, that if we can include that in what we're thinking about too it will benefit everybody um i'm at a major label it hasn't impacted me in the same way but um but i am hearing from a, a lot of people in the industry about that they're worried about the smaller companies that they work for are they going to be there next year and many of those companies support artists Mute. thanks marianne i uh, Anybody else want to jump in here? Okay, I'm going to throw myself on, uh, and I, I just building on uh, 
what, uh, when Mike started, he put in his presentation, and it's been circulated around, some of the recommendations that we're here to begin with, based on some of, the, I thought, the really insightful uh, feedback from Charlotte and Aaron, I've added a couple here. So uh, I'll kick things off and, and I'll move a couple motions building on that. And, and perhaps Charlotte and Aaron, if you have any feedback or anybody else for them, feel free to, to ask away. So the first item I'll move is motion 1A. Uh, and this is, which was previously circulated, that City Council requests the Government of Canada to extend the Canada Emerge Wage subsidy at current funding levels for music industry employers and workers, and also to ensure adequate financial support continues to be accessible for self-employed and gig workers. And that's what I know a number of you helped work on, so I'll move that. 1B, uh, this is, which Mike was referring to, is the motion that TMAC recommend that, and this is for the city, the Economic and uh, Culture Division, uh, to consider further online resources to support artists. Uh, and then I, based on some of the feedback from Charlotte and Aaron, I, I did, I, I have two more here that, I, that I'd like to move. One is motion C here, that the Economic and Community Development Committee uh, request the city manager to include recommendations to support affordable housing and a universal basic income for, for musicians. As, so the, the city manager uh, is bringing forward a comprehensive report in, in the coming months on recommendations long term that uh, to address inequities that have been exposed by COVID. And based on the feedback, this would be us asking the city manager to include recommendations in those two particular and specific areas, affordable housing for artists and a universal basic income for our artists. And then motion D, uh, and I think this is where we got to get really creative, and I, it's worth you know, in this moment of instability, it's worth being creative. This would be that TMAC recommend that the economic and um, that the music office consult with our shelter support and housing administration division and the housing secretariat division at the city to see how Toronto's COVID shelter and housing responses could align with TMAC's efforts to support venues and musicians. Uh, this gets really interesting. I'll tell you from you know, wearing my public health hat, uh, we are, as part of the housing response, seeking to ensure that in creating temporary venues, you're creating places that have individual rooms for people as opposed to open spaces to enable physical distancing. But let's get creative here. If we have open spaces, venues that are vacant and struggling, and we're looking for temporary opportunities to provide a range of supports at the city, are there ways to partner together, either to support musicians who might not have jobs at the moment to help us develop and implement strategies, or to partner with venues directly, so that we're spending monies to support venues to help people, as opposed to spending money to lease hotels to help people. It's an interesting idea, and I think, you know, let's, let's look into it, like why not? Uh, let's get creative along in this immediate moment, but also long term. So, I'll, I'm happy to to move both those original two motions that we'd all collectively worked on before, but also the additional ones here. Um, and so I'll put that on the floor and then open it back up to to see if there are anybody else who who wishes to speak still on this item. And I, and again, just actually in closing, uh, thank you uh, to Mike, of course, always, but Charlotte and Aaron in particular for bringing a lot of the ideas forward and consulting in advance, and, and I think that was exceptionally helpful. Uh, so let me just open that up. Anybody else want to speak here on this one? Uh, Sean, go ahead. Hi there. Um, I, I was having a conversation with some... Um, Thank, thank you for everyone's recommendations. They're awesome, by the way. Um, had a similar conversation uh, um, with some parents, um, I have nieces and nephews that are the Toronto District School Board are looking for safer spaces for some classrooms too. Um, venues could operate in that capacity. Um, I, I kind of, because we have liquor licenses, I was kind of like, hey, maybe, maybe not. But if, if, if we're going to go down that motion, that road, maybe that's an alternative for um, a classroom that could fit in a venue um, with, with the same idea of the support for the shelters. So again, just trying to think creatively and, and maybe we could include that as well. So thanks for that, Sean. I'll just say uh, I'm doing this on the, on the fly, but that's not a problem, is 
Uh, I, it would be to amend the motion to explore how the City of Toronto's COVID shelter, housing, and Toronto public health response could align. And so that, that to broaden it, to your point there, is there's shelter, there's housing, but could there be other areas of the broader public health response in the city, whether that's supporting safe school reopening, whether that's, I can tell you, and we've had partnerships, for example, uh, temporary food bank locations where we've partnered with you know, the YMCA, for example. And so that, to, to Sean's point, to, to broaden that so we don't miss potential opportunities. Um, and I'm- Yep, great. And, and sorry, this is, I have the clerk's department, you can't see them sitting beside me and I'm rewriting the motion and handing it to them in real time. Uh, does anybody else, because they now have to revise that before we could vote on it, just to add in the Toronto Public Health response as well. Anybody else want to kill time and speak for, want to jump in while they're doing that? Otherwise, we're all just going to be hanging out for 30 seconds. Hannah, yeah, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, good to be with you today. I was, I wanted to address uh, some of the, the concerns that, um, Dr. Ray had brought up on the TMA, specifically around some of the grants that TMA is offering uh, for its members. And I wondered if one of our responses or recommendations might be, if we're already making a response to federal government and provincial government, and we're talking about municipal, obviously, if we might make a recommendation that the grants be tax exempt, um, the money that we get in grants to make uh, recordings or whatever, none of that money really comes to us as income, and yet we're taxed on it as income. So perhaps we could make a recommendation across the board that way, uh, and, that, and that would be helpful. Okay, Mike, can I ask just as I'm looking to Wordsmith, can I ask that that's one that We'll, we'll circle back after this as, as we seek to, to flesh out the specifics of how we can word that, Mike? Yep, sure. Absolutely, great. Okay, uh, and let me turn to the folks. So you guys, you got the updated versions? Okay, anybody else, final call for speakers on this one? We, we have the venues item coming up after, otherwise, perfect, and so I have the revised. So, so seeing no other speakers then there are so there are four items here. Could I ask the, the clerks, we'll take them one by one. The first is 1A. Uh, this is for City Council to request the Government of Canada for a number of specific pieces here around Canada emergency wage subsidy and support for the self-employed and gig worker sector. Uh, so that you can see that then posted there on the screen. And um, so can I see, by, just by way of a show of hands, all those in favor? Opposed, okay, that carries. Motion 1B, uh, this is requesting our music office to uh, further develop online resources around supporting musicians directly. That will be put up on the screen. Okay, all those in favor, uh, again, by way of a show of hands, opposed, if any, that carries. Uh, motion C, uh, this is part one of, of two of the Charlotte and Aaron motion, as I will uh, politely refer to it. This is to include affordable housing and a universal basic income for musicians as part of the city's overall recovery and rebuild final report coming forward in the next couple months. Um, all those in favor? Opposed, if any, carried. That's just a quiet little motion calling for affordable housing and a universal basic income, no big deal. Um, and then motion D, uh, and this is for our um, economic, uh, our Toronto Music Office to work with the general manager of Shelter Support and Housing Administration, the executive director of our housing secretariat, uh, as well as Toronto Public Health to explore how our broader shelter housing and public health responses could align with efforts to support both venues and musicians as well. So to, to look at, at pulling different layers of the city's response together and to get the best, the best mutual alignment and to use money well. So all those in favor of that, uh, opposed, if any, carried. Um, so thank you. Uh, so that takes us on that item. We we that was uh, that was helpful and excellent. So we now will turn to item six point two, 
Uh, this is current impacts on live music venues. Do I need to do more as amended? Okay, I need to do one final item as amended. So that's all of those together. All those in favor? Opposed, if any, carried. Uh, so then item uh, 6.2, which is a discussion on further discussion on impacts on venues. Uh, we're going to have a presentation here from Mike uh, Tanner, but also Tara Galaro from Toronto Public Health, who's joined us. Thank you, Tara. Uh, and then we do have Lisa, who's going to speak to us on this item, uh, and then we'll bring it inside. So, Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank, thanks, Joe. Um, once again, uh, I'm just going to kind of set the table here um, and then uh, with some of the general uh, concerns and uh, impacts of the pandemic on live music venues. We'll turn it over to Tara, my colleague at Toronto Public Health, whom some of you know, uh, who will do a lot of the heavy lifting on the uh, public health piece. And then uh, we'll have Lisa Zbitnu uh, speaking, and I'm sure there are other TMAC members who are going to want to weigh in on this as well. So um, skipping to slide two, please. So obviously areas of concern with live music venues are, are over and above the over overarching uh, element here is the fact that they have, were the first out. Most venues ceased operations somewhere in the second or third week of March. It's widely expected that they're going to be among the very, very last back. Uh, and during this time, uh, which we don't know how long it's going to last, um, venues, like every other business, uh, have got ongoing costs, whether it's commercial rent, property tax, insurance, uh, other operating costs, staffing, et cetera. But unlike other uh, types of businesses, live music venues have had zero revenues during the pandemic, unlike restaurants, unlike retail, unlike manufacturing. Uh, and that's that puts them in a, in a sad and, and unique position. Um, the current reopening guidelines coming down from public health authorities. 90% uh, of this is from the province, as you're going to hear from Tara. A little bit uh, pertains to the city, but these uh, reopening guidelines have, have created uh, a little bit of confusion. Uh, the landscape changes rapidly, and it's left most venues not uh, sure of, of you know, what, what the, what the uh, relevant regulations are, and, and very, very few have experimented with any kind of, um, you know, low capacity uh, events of any type. There's a lot of uncertainty, clearly. Uh, we don't know what the fall will bring, what things will be like through the winter, both in terms of the um, trajectory of the disease, uh, and also, frankly, with consumer confidence. Uh, our, our venue operators on TMAC and, and others will, will tell you that um, they're not sure uh, how soon audiences are going to feel comfortable coming back into the venue to, to enjoy music. It could be a, a long time before, you know, a vaccine or other um, measures are introduced to bring people back the way the way we would like them all to be. Uh, next slide, please. So specifically, some of the financial concerns that venues are reporting, um, they are advocating for some bridge funding uh, in between the immediate triage that was rolled out mostly by the federal government in the early weeks and months of the pandemic, leading towards something that would look like a long-term secure funding. Uh, Canadian Live Music Association and others have advocated for something like a Canadian Live Music Fund, similar to those brought in in Australia and, and Germany and a few other years. European countries as well. Um, but it's clear that, that our venues are going to need uh, a lot of uh, public sector support. Um, commercial venues that are not used to necessarily receiving that kind of support, but we're in an unprecedented situation. Um, when it comes to rent and tax, the uh, Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance, CECRA, program uh, is not mandatory. Uh, and so we know that uh, a great many landlords have chosen not to take advantage of the opportunity to participate in that program, which means that their tenants, the commercial tenants like the venues, uh, do not get the benefits of rent reduction uh, that they would if, if the program were structured differently. Here in Toronto, due to, uh, in large part, great advocacy and, and program development by, by TMEC members, we've got the um, live music venue tax relief program uh, through which about 50 venues now uh, eligible for 2020 property tax relief uh, of up to 50 percent. However, we know that even though right now we intend that program to be brought back in 2021 and beyond, we don't have an ironclad guarantee that that's the case. So 
uh, something long term that was fixed would would help venues breathe a little bit easier. Uh, and then third point on the slide here is the insurance issue, which has really uh, come up in a big way uh, in the last few months, especially not only are live music venues reporting that their premiums have increased twofold, threefold, fourfold or beyond, but lots and lots are saying now that their brokers are actually unable to find them uh, commercial liability insurance at any cost. Um, brokers are going to, you know, 5, 10, 15 different underwriters and not being able to secure commercial liability insurance for their clients. And since many commercial leases in, uh, require commercial liability insurance as a condition of the lease, technically some of our venues are, are, are or are soon going to be in breach of their lease if they don't have this insurance. Next slide, please. Turning uh, to the transition to what you're going to hear from uh, Tara on, the public health guidelines, uh, again, uh, there's some differences between what the City of Toronto is responsible for and what the province of Ontario is responsible for, uh, specifically when we're talking about uh, the bulk of the regulations coming from the province, um, the channels of communication for local businesses or, or organizations representing those businesses to speak directly to um, the the uh, authorities at the province has been a, a little bit difficult so to get messaging through either through tph or, or other mechanisms isn't isn't simple thing the main concern is around the capacity limits uh, dr beaumont referred to that in her presentation um the moment you bring in a live performance into any kind of a venue right away you're capped at 50. Uh, and compared with other businesses or spaces like restaurants or casinos or places of worship uh, these regulations are are inconsistent uh, there's also a little bit of confusion around what exact infrastructure is required plexiglass or other barriers between the performers and the audience and and what what has to happen with with seating arrangements uh inside the venue um there are as i mentioned rapid changes uh, it seems as if each week there's there's an update or a tweak to an existing regulation which creates a lot of uncertainty in the venue community even things that you would think would be fairly straightforward like a definition of what constitutes a performance seemingly are, are subject to interpretation um, and all of this has led very, very, very few venues to think. Well, you know what? I'm I'm going to I'm going to give it a shot and try a show here with with a very small audience. Uh, from a business feasibility standpoint, uh, we've heard of very few venues that are that are leaping in. And and honestly, uh, I've spoken to a great many venue operators, and and they have no desire to be a vector for disease as well. So until there's a lot more clarity around what's going on, uh, venues are cautious, understandably. Final point before I turn it over to Tara is that there are exemption processes, uh, both for the City of Toronto's restaurant exemption. If you're a restaurant, you're allowed up to 100 capacity with the capability of applying to get up to 200 in your room. Uh, then, then separately, uh, there's a portal that the province has set up through which any stakeholder can request review of a proposal uh, if they're requesting any kind of exemption to any guideline, whether it's capacity or, or the way people move at, at the event or the venue. Um, to date, I actually don't know of any Toronto live music venues that have had uh, successful responses from either of these uh, exemption processes in that, you know, they, they would get an increased capacity or, or um, ways in which the, the, the guidelines could be reconsidered for their situation. So although the processes occur or, or are available, rather, at this point, we haven't heard of anything that's, uh, you know, a positive outcome. I, I just heard back uh, from the Elma Combo, for example, who, who applied for provincial exemption back on August the 9th uh, for the series of shows that they've been doing, and they still haven't heard anything. So it's a slow process. With that, um, I'll hand it over to Tara, who can really get uh, into some detail on, on the public health guidelines that are of ongoing concern to venues. Over to you, Tara. Hi, everybody. Uh, can I just confirm that you can hear me? Yeah, we, we can hear you, Tara. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for also uh, having me at this meeting. Um, as Mike mentioned, the public health guidelines are quite confusing and they change very rapidly, so I'm hoping to provide some clarification to those. Um, 
one of the things uh, in particular that's often not clear is which level of government creates the rules and regulations and who is responsible for what. And this is particularly important for any type of advocacy efforts that you might want to do. Um, so that's what this chart is first depicting. Uh, specifically related to COVID-19, it's the responsibility of the provincial government to issue orders under the Reopening Ontario Act. Uh, an example of that is the rules for stage three, which is regulation 364-20. Uh, you might see that listed in the, these PowerPoint slides. Uh, it is then the responsibility of the local government or the City of Toronto for us to promote those regulations. And one of the ways that we do that is uh, creating guidance documents for different industries and stakeholders, which are currently on our website. In addition to that, we also support uh, business owners and operators in trying to implement those regulations. So a lot of the work that Mike has been doing to, to help you. We also participate in some provincial discussions. Some of our Toronto Public Health doctors, for example, sit at the Public Health Measures Table, which is led by the Ministry of Health. We enforce the requirements under the Reopening Ontario Act, along with other provincial regulations and city bylaws. Um, in general, that enforcement uh, is a complaints-driven process. It's also uh, a progressive enforcement process, which is based on the severity of uh, the non-compliance, including education, warnings, as well as charges. And then we also issue uh, city bylaws. So some examples that we've seen related to COVID are the mask bylaw, um, physical distancing, and uh, the one related to food premises. And then, of course, as, as business owners and operators, it's your responsibility to understand what those regulations and bylaws are assess the risks within your business, uh, as well as the ability to manage those risks, and implement measures to reduce the risk and follow the regulations and the bylaws in order to keep staff and the public safe. Next slide, please. So now that we uh, have a little bit of a base in terms of who does what, I, I'd like to discuss some of the public health measures and the stage three regulations that are particularly challenging for the music industry, such as capacity limits. Um, I'd, I'd like to preface this first to say that all gathering limits or capacity limits are subject to the guest's ability to maintain physical distance of two meters or six feet from all those outside of their household or social circle. Uh, so specifically for performing arts venues, the gathering limits are set by the provincial regulations, and they are 100 guests outdoors or less, and 50 guests indoors or less. And this is the same as most staffed or supervised events. For restaurants or food premises, there is no maximum for outdoor patios. However, the gathering limits for indoors within restaurants, that is a, a regulation uh, by, it's covered by the City of Toronto bylaw, and it cannot exceed 100 patrons within that restaurant. Um, that is subject to an exemption process, which Mike briefly mentioned, and I will go into more details about that exemption process in a few moments. Uh, but first, I wanted to address um, the bullet in red, which says that food premises with live music can only have 50 people in their venues or less. Um, and uh, this obviously has major implications for your industry. Um, the reason for this is because the way the provincial regulation is written. Um, and I included in that box on the right-hand side, I pulled out um, copied and pasted pieces of the regulation that are applicable. Um, under the bars, restaurants, bars, et cetera, section, it states that a person or group under contract with the establishment may dance, sing, or perform music in compliance with the requirements set out in Section 11. Section 11 is where the regulations for performing arts venues are described, and it states that the total number of spectators permitted to be in the venue in which the performance or rehearsal takes place at any time can be no more than 50 spectators indoors. So as a result of this, if you bring live music into a restaurant, the gathering limit is then reduced down to 50 as opposed to the 100 uh, capacity limit uh, set by the city. Um, unfortunately, in addition to being reduced down to 50, restaurants that bring in live music can then no longer apply for uh, or qualify for the indoor dining capacity uh, exemption, which is a city process, because the regulations for performing arts venues are um, related to the provincial regulations, and the city does not have the authority to provide an exemption for those provincial regulations. 
Next slide, please. So now I'd like to talk about that indoor dining exemption process. If you do choose to operate your venue as a food premise without live music, you can apply for the city's indoor dining uh, capacity limits exemption. It's a process that allows food premises um, to apply for increased capacity above that 100 customer limit, up to 30% capacity or 200 patrons, whichever is less. It's an online application form and it's for any person operating an adult entertainment club, billiard hall, eating or drinking establishment, entertainment establishment, nightclub, or a place of amusement. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, if, you are, if you have live music um, at the restaurant, then you will not qualify for this type of an exemption process. Next slide, please. In order to be approved, the premise has to comply with all the applicable requirements under the Ontario regulation for stage three, as well as the Toronto Public Health guidelines for reopening your restaurant under, uh, within COVID-19. The premise has to be configured to ensure physical distancing requirements with more than 100 customers. Uh, it has to implement and maintain well-documented enhanced cleaning and disinfecting and sanitizing measures offer and maintain adequate washroom facilities, implement and maintain effective crowd control measures, and also have a history of substantial compliance with applicable legislation. So as part of this application process, you can also submit a sketch or a diagram of your premise with your application. Uh, you will receive an email confirming uh, that the city has received your application. City of Toronto or Toronto Public Health staff review your application and I've been told that you should be receiving a response of some kind from a TPH staff within about a week. Um, a, a TPH staff will also come to the venue to inspect uh, to ensure that all of the criteria have been met and if you are approved you will receive a letter of approval indicating uh, above 100 how many patrons you can uh, allow within your space. Next slide please. So as Mike mentioned, the province also has an exemption process. Uh, however, this is different than the city's exemption process that I had just described, and it's uh, really helpful to know the difference. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the city does not have the authority to provide an exemption for any provincial regulations. Um, the reason why we have uh, an indoor dining capacity exemption process for the city is because it is a city bylaw that restricts restaurants uh, to have a capacity of 100 people or less. So for businesses and sectors that either are not able to open in stage three or seen significant challenges opening during stage three, um, that's what this exemption process is for. Um, and uh, if, if I know that many of you are, are having or experiencing challenges reopening as a result of the stage three regulations, um, so it's recommended that you use this portal to submit um, an application to try to um, hopefully get a response back from the province so that you can, uh, so that they understand the, the challenges that your industry is experiencing and hopefully come back with a response uh, for a better solution to keep the music industry alive while also um, being careful of uh, staff and, and public health and safety. Next slide, please. Now, once you are able to reopen, there are a lot of public health measures that you need to take into consideration in order to reduce the spread of COVID-19 within the community. Um, the two that I will describe may or may not be a, a challenge, but they're very important for you to be aware of. And the first is physical distancing. Uh, guests must maintain two meters or six feet uh, physical distance from all others outside of their household and social circle. So for things like this, you need to consider where tables and chairs or seating are within your venue. Um, in addition to that, you have to think about uh, washrooms or foyers or hallways where space is more limited and it might be more difficult for people to maintain that six feet physical distance from each other. Performers and staff must also physically distance from every other person, except during three instances, which are listed on the slide there. Uh, one being if it's necessary for the performers to be closer to each other, other performers, for the purposes of that performance, um, in order to facilitate the purchase of admission, food or beverage, and also for the purposes of health and safety. Next, I wanted to talk about barriers because I understand that this is uh, an area of confusion with the regulations. Singers and players of wind and brass instruments 
must be separated from spectators by a physical barrier, uh, such as plexiglass. This is required for both indoor and outdoor venues. Um, but unfortunately, the province doesn't provide uh, a whole lot of detail in terms of what that physical barrier needs to look like, the size or the structure. Um, it does have to achieve the objective of preventing water droplet transmission, given the type of activity, um, which is why uh, it's only for singers or players of wind or brass instruments. Um, and also, uh, it has to be taken into account the physical environment or the space. Uh, select products that are, have a durable surface and are compatible with any type of cleaning or disinfectant uh, product that you will be using. And of course, um, ventilation is a key component with um, our COVID-19 public health measures. So you have to ensure that there's adequate airflow and circulation and that those, the barrier isn't uh, impeding that. Next slide, please. In addition to physical distancing and barriers, there are many other recommendations and public health measures that need to be taken into account. Um, so I have uh, chosen to put up, uh, to link to guidance documents or else I would be here for another uh, two hours talking to you and I don't think you wanna hear me talking for that long. Um, the first is the guidance for indoor and outdoor events and gatherings and the COVID-19 guidance for reopening your restaurant. Um, I think these two are the most applicable to, uh, to you. And uh, we understand that regulations and recommendations and the information is changing extremely quickly, as Mike had mentioned. Uh, and as a result of that, our guidance documents are also changing. So I recommend that you visit our website often to ensure that you're, you're reviewing the most up-to-date guidance. Um, and finally, I'd just like to leave you with three important public health considerations, um, and that is proximity, duration, and numbers. Proximity, maintain physical distancing and wear a mask to avoid respiratory droplets. Duration, limit the length and time people are together. And numbers, reduce gathering size for physical distancing and better ventilation. These three things, while they may present some challenges, they are really critical to help keep the staff and public safe when you're reopening your venue. Next slide, please. Uh, thanks, Tara. That's very comprehensive and informative. I'll just uh, jump back in here again, as I did in the uh, in the first item, to uh, um, run a couple of ideas by TMAC members here. Um, your involvement um, is always useful um, and indispensable, really, in assisting with developing recommendations. Here are some possible examples which are reflected in the draft motions that were sent around. Um, advocacy with the Government of Ontario for long-term financial support to address some of the financial issues that I discussed earlier. Um, for more flexibility in reopening guidelines to address some of the things that Tara brought to light, um, such as the fact that immediately bringing in live performance um, brings in a hard cap of, of 50 patrons. Um, insurance being a provincially regulated industry, uh, perhaps advocacy with the government of Ontario to meet and discuss and bring the insurance industry to the table might be something you want to consider. Uh, ban on commercial evictions, uh, unequivocal and firmly stated. Um, and then have the participation for the local, the Ontario version of the CECRA uh, be made mandatory for property owners. Again, all things that you might want to consider. Uh, advocacy with the Government of Canada to extend and improve the existing CECRA program. And as uh, I think we mentioned right off the top, uh, explore the development of a permanent Canadian Live Music Fund as a long-term uh, financial support for the industry. Uh, recommendations toward the City of Toronto uh, to look at how the City of Toronto might be involved in helping uh, local music venues with this insurance situation that you're facing right now. Uh, and finally, uh, advocate with City Council uh, to make permanent the live music venue tax uh, relief program that, that was just introduced uh, earlier this year. Um, so with that, uh, that concludes the presentation that uh, Tara and I had, had prepared. I'll turn it back over um, to you, Joe, to manage any, any comments or questions at this point or whether you want to skip to the speakers first. Well, thanks, 
Mike and Tara, that was comprehensive and you know, if you were confused trying to open a venue before, that presentation gives you a sense of how confusing it is for everybody, uh, certainly. Um, we, why don't, let's, we have Lisa um, on to speak to us. Let's hear from Lisa and then we'll bring it in for questions and comments. That way uh, Lisa's feedback can help inform it. So do we still have Lisa on the line? Yeah, Lisa, are you there? Lisa, I think you're on mute. mute. All right. If, if Lisa comes back on, we'll uh, we'll certainly we'll hear from her. So then let's let's bring it into committee, uh, members of committee. If you both, if you have questions, if you want to ask of either Mike or Tara or comments, both on in general, but on the the uh, the proposed amendment there for provincial, national, and city action. Jeff, I have you first. I saw you. Hi, Tara. How's it going? Hi, Jeff. I'm good. How are you? Listen, um, my impression from the provincial regulations is provincial health has decided that there's a big distinction between a live performance and a restaurant, which logically I don't understand because the problem would be the droplets coming out from singing. But once they've asked us to put plexiglass around the stage, I don't logically see the difference. Has anybody in Toronto Health point blank asked someone in provincial health what the difference is? And why are they viewing performance as being a higher risk? That they won't allow us the same 30% exemption that a restaurant can apply for provincially? I can't say confidently that that question has been asked point blank. However, Mike and I have both brought this uh, issue forward and have asked for it to be discussed at that public health measures table that I mentioned. Um, and more recently also, um, I asked that they also include the distinction uh, between the, um, when live performance has to come into a restaurant, there's a drop to 50, um, to 50 cap. Um, so, Unfortunately, uh, the timing uh, sort of bumped this discussion at that table. And uh, in August, mid-August, when Mike and I presented this, schools were uh, the high priority topic at that table. And currently, um, the trend of COVID cases is taking over. So um, I know that Dr. Mowat continues to uh, bring it forward as a reminder to that table that we'd still like to discuss it. Uh, unfortunately, there's just been other priorities that have taken over and have bumped it lower on, on that list. So it, it, we continue to bring it forward, and Mike and I are continuing to be in conversation. And um, hopefully at some point, they will be able to have that discussion. Uh, in addition to that, I think those of you who are applying for the provincial exemption process, the more that they hear from different venues um, or different owners and operators, the, the more they'll realize that this is an issue that needs to be dealt with within that regulation. Second question was, is, do you have a list of who the province has actually exempted of the applications? I do not. Is it possible, Councillor Cressley, that TMAC could ask someone in the city to both get the list and get the distinction between, ask that question that I'm asking in the first place, the distinction between restaurants and performing arts, what the risk is? Yeah, Mike, Mike and I certainly will, will seek to track down the list of exemptions that have been provided provincially, but also as we continue to, to push this item at the broader provincial agenda, so we can, we can take that on. Mike, I spoke for you, but we can. Uh, others, thanks, Jeff. Uh, others, questions or comments around the table? I only see Jeff at the moment. If we can get back to that screen where I have, I can see everybody. There we are. Uh, yeah, I have Tracy and then Sean and then Paul. Tracy. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm speaking from the basement of Lula, so I hope the internet is okay. Um, thank you, Mike and Tara, for, for that um, a very thorough list of, um, well, of recommendations. I just wanted to reiterate the importance of the this insurance piece. Um, I think it's something that was already an issue for 
our industry uh, for venues before COVID. It's become an emergency at this point. Um, and that even the venues that have something in place at this point, I think are going to have problems for next year. So it would be hugely helpful for you uh, to help us with that conversation with the province. Um, that's all. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, I had Sean next. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll second Tracy on the insurance. It's a, it's a, it is a emergency situation. Um, so several of us here have been advocating uh, through different channels to uh, have some meetings with the province and the Canadian Insurance Bureau of Canada. Um, that's something that's slated for early October. So hopefully we get some sort of action, at least an, an open dialogue moving forward at that point. Um, and just to reiterate, uh, it, it seems an odd time with the COVID numbers going up for venues to be getting, pursuing the numbers to be a little slightly higher without the 50 cap. But this is something that we're hoping to have in place for when it is safe to get back to. So we're not doing this if it's December or February or March. We're not doing this process then. So if, it, it's a long, slow process, but. It's something that we're hoping to have in place, um, you know, when we're getting toward our um, actually reopening and recovery, um, just so we're not held down by red tape at that point. Excellent. Thanks, Sean. Uh, I have Paul next, and then I know Lisa has rejoined, so we'll, we'll bring in Lisa to hear from her. But, Paul, uh, I have you next here. Sure, thanks. Um, so just quickly, yeah, thanks again for the presentation. I thought that was really helpful. Um, I, one thing, just in terms of the motion, uh, I saw that uh, we're asking for flexible treatment on reopening. I think that that's really important. I'm wondering if it's worth also asking for at least equal treatment with establishments that are allowed to reopen, such as you know restaurants, casinos, places of worship, movie theaters, um, so that you know venues, uh, live performance venues, aren't getting what amounts to a worse deal uh, for no reason. Um, second, I, I'm wondering if uh, I just have two questions. One is, is there any insight into why capacity limits that are being set um, aren't connected to occupancy limits since we have a large range of sizes of venues and it seems like those things should be tied together? Um, and, and then the, the second question is, in terms of, uh, kind of relates back to my first point about equal treatment, it's just more of a question. In terms of places of worship, um, if they have live music at a place of worship, are they suddenly subject to the 50-person cap or are they not? subject to the 50 person cap. And Tara, Hi, do you want to respond um, to that there? Sure. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, in terms of the uh, occupancy limits and why they're not based on a percent capacity, um, I actually don't have a, a very good answer for you. Um, I am not sure why the province has chosen a flat uh, a top out of 50 people uh, as opposed to the percent capacity. Uh, I believe in what Mike and I have submitted to the public health measures table addresses that and questions why that's not the case, recognizing that we have a lot of venues in the city of Toronto where they're quite large and having only 50 people can space out significantly. Um, in terms of your second question, uh, I empathize with you. I'm not sure why um, it's not consistent across the board for different industries, why a place of worship is able to have a 30% capacity, whereas another venue is, is limited to 50. Um, there, uh, the only thing that I can think of um, that puts a music venue or a restaurant at a slightly higher risk than a place of worship is um, that it's a uh, a venue that serves alcohol. And when uh, alcohol is consumed, then our behaviors are adjusted and we tend to forget uh, some of those uh, public health measures like physical distancing. However, I still think that it's um, something that we want to address. And Mike and I have continued to try and push this uh, to be brought up at that public health measures table. Um, if I could just quickly uh, address one of Paul's points before Lisa speaks as well. Um, if TMAC is going to advocate for, for equal treatment, as Paul is, is suggesting perhaps um, you do, um, I think it would be important to focus on the, on the uh, capacity limits, um, you know, the 30% of occupancy element of it, rather than, say, what's happening in cinemas, which is up to 50 per room, which, my knowledge of Toronto venues, might only benefit 
a handful of the venues that have you know more than one room where they could sequester people so i would focus that change on the 30 percent of the overall occupancy load rather than some of the other you know event space type uh, arrangements mike i don't know if you're aware but in the province of quebec it's actually 250 people i am aware paul did you have did you have any any other comments or questions there just before we move away from you no, th thanks yeah. for the responses, and uh, I think uh, what Mike just said made a lot of sense to me. Yeah, and Paul, just so you know, here I'm working with clerks to adjust in that draft motion circulated along about applying a more flexible reopening guideline to ensure that it's a fair and more flexible to your comments. Uh, I have, so Lisa was going to speak, and so we missed her earlier, so we'll bring her in here um, to give us her deputation, and then I, Spencer, I see you, I'll come to you after. Uh, Lisa, do we have you connected now? Yes, she do. I lost internet. I'm now connected by phone, so uh, thank you for your patience. No, of course. Um, I first, I first off uh, want to express gratitude to TMAC for the property tax reduction. Uh, you have uh, created a, a lifeline for venues. Uh, I know we're so well represented within TMAC with uh, uh, Tracy and. Uh, Sean and Jeff uh, for pushing that through, but but just on behalf of venues outside of TMAC, uh, that property tax reduction, uh, you know, it couldn't have come at a better time. It represents over a month of rent to a venue like uh, the Phoenix, where our rent is our largest uh, line item in our uh, P&L, um, and. Uh, so thank you very much because I know this wasn't a, a COVID measure. This was years of work on behalf of uh, all of you, Joe, Mike, everyone. Uh, thank you for that because you know, particularly if it does continue, it's not just about getting us through the worst of the siege at the moment, but will help us in. 2021 and beyond to uh, help rebuild our businesses in a way that uh, just allows for a much smoother relationship with with our landlords. Uh, so amazing work, everybody, and uh, as always to Mike Tanner, who uh, has been such a, a godsend to all of us, just to keep you know communication open and you know constantly. Uh, represent us. Uh, we're super appreciative. Um, I also want to say, in terms of, of Tara and everybody else at Public Health in Toronto, um, just being so available and accessible with um, you know immediate communication uh, has made us feel much less isolated. Um, you know, that said, and, and Tara and Mike are aware of this, uh, I did go to the province uh, Monday at a call represented by uh, seven members of the Minister of Culture, led by um, uh, Kevin Finnerty, who is the Assistant Deputy of Culture, when pushing this whole point of why uh, the uh, why the 50? Because we are one of those venues that has a license that can operate as a restaurant. We actually moved to some events to 100 people. Uh, they went very smoothly. Um, we got amazing feedback. But when we did go for the exemptions for 200 and got to the point of talking to an inspector, uh, further conversations happened where. Uh, it was the interpretation of the city that even as a restaurant, uh, the capacity has to decline to 50 for live performance. So when I called the, uh, when I had the conversation with, like I said, the members of, of Minister of Culture, they in fact say that that is uh, a different interpretation than is intended and that a restaurant license does not have to collapse to 50. Um, and, you know, with Toronto simply 
enforcing what the province guidelines are. And I completely uh, understand Tara's interpretation based on what she just presented. They are saying that it's actually not the case. So I did submit a case on behalf of the Phoenix, um, suggesting you know what we had done, everything we are doing, uh, that the minister, uh, the Ministry of Culture, was going to represent us and send to Ministry of Health to try and uh, I guess uh, unstick this particular issue because there seems to be different interpretations. And so that is in process. Um, they too have been very responsive. I think everybody has been sensitive to our issues that I've talked to both on the municipal and the provincial side. But the provincial side, when I cited the examples that I gave to um, uh, public health uh, officials in Toronto said, no, we are okay to proceed at 100 and the exemption beyond 100. Uh, so, you know, I, I just thought that was important information to share and wonder from, you know, the standpoint of public health uh, for Toronto, if other venues outside of the Phoenix were to attempt to do the same thing, whether or not that might not expedite our ability to be heard and represented because again, Toronto is only enforcing provincial guidelines. Uh, from what I understand, Toronto can't do anything unless the province amends those guidelines. So it's a very clear interpretation. Uh, an amendment sounds like something that will take some legaling. Um, but you know, that being said, uh, keeping it outside of, of, of legal representation, are we in a better position by having a collective representation or having other venues reach out directly to the province uh, to um, represent a case that the largest city in the country feels that the interpretation is X, province is coming back saying that it's Y. So th thanks for that, Lisa. Um, so technically here, because, because Lisa's not on the committee, she's giving a deputation, uh, um, technically Lisa can't ask Tara questions directly, but perhaps Tara, I will just ask, do you have any feedback on Lisa's, uh, on Lisa's deputation, both the experience and the, the interpretation of Toronto and, and uh, as it relates to the mm -hmm. capacity? Uh, yeah, thank you, Lisa. I think how you have explained it uh, is uh, actually perfect. Um, as you mentioned, um, the way that the provincial regulation is currently written, um, our legal department has interpreted such that when live music comes to a restaurant, the capacity limit is reduced to 50. Um, and uh, trust me, I tried to read that so many different ways to find a loophole, and I could not. Um, so. Um, as you have mentioned, trying to uh, build a case with other venues and respond to the problems, I think, is uh, a solid recommendation. In this case, it is the Ministry of Health who is writing these uh, orders and these regulations. And the ministry that you spoke to is the Ministry of um, Sport, Culture, and Tourism. I may have gotten that name wrong. Um, however, perhaps um, it is an... Um, misunderstanding between the two ministries um, or miscommunication. I can't say that, of course, for sure. That's my speculation. However, um, you, you are absolutely correct. Uh, the City of Toronto has to enforce the regulations as they are written. Um, so thank you for your comment. Thanks for that. And thanks, Lisa. Um, next on the list, I had Spencer. Uh, and then let me just do a check. Anybody else uh, to speak on this item after Spencer? Okay, Spencer, you're up. Uh, and I think you're still on mute, Spencer, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi, I just wanted to uh, echo the comments from Paul and Jeff earlier um, regarding that uh, the venues it would be more appropriate for them to have a percentage capacity rather than a fixed capacity and and that uh, places of worship 
in fact, uh, many often do have liquor licenses. And um, I know, in fact, the most frequent applicants of special occasion permits as well. And point out that even weddings are, you know, subject to that thirty percent cap, not not a fixed, not a fixed number. Um, which, while admittedly there are some social behavior differences in in uh, in venues, um, you know, places of worship are dealing with a higher risk demographic. So that you know, it would be much more appropriate for venues to be to have that kind of capacity limit, not not any kind of fixed number at all. That's all. Thanks, Spencer. Uh, anybody else want to speak on this item? So it's Tara. Am I able to comment on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Tara. I'll let you. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, mention that uh, you're right, places of worship have these 30%, up to 30% capacity. Uh, however, that's for religious services, rites, and ceremonies. So any type of social gathering associated with that, uh, such as a wedding reception, they would now be capped down to the 50 people indoors as well. Okay. Uh, thanks for that clarification, Tara. Okay, I'm going to throw myself on, on to, to speak here at the end. Um, so I'll begin by, by moving that motion. Thank you uh, to members of the committee who worked, I know, hard with, with Mike and, and our office in advance uh, to move this. So I actually have to, move, I have to formally move it all. So one, I have to move motion 1A. This is that TMAC recommend. Um, this is for the government of Ontario. Uh, to look at long-term financial support, uh, to Paul's point, flexible and fair uh, reopening guidelines that uh, treat uh, music venues fairly in the context of all other businesses, ensuring necessary health protocols, of course, uh, to address at the provincial level insurance concerns, to look at uh, a ban on evictions for music-related businesses, as well as mandatory participation in the Emergency Commercial Assistance Program. That's 1A. Uh, 1B, uh, which was developed, this is the TMAC uh, looking at the Government of Canada, specifically calling to extend and improve the Commercial Assistance Program, and in doing so to make it mandatory, as well to develop a, a permanent Canada Live Music Fund to stimulate activity um, in the sector. Uh, and then two motions for the City of Toronto. Uh, the, the first is to work to develop, for the City to develop a group insurance program for live music venues, uh, which including looking at underwriting the policy by the City assuming the risk and guaranteeing coverage of unpaid fees. And second uh, is TMAC calling on the City to make permanent the live music venue tax class that was established. So that's the summary of all of them and thank you again in advance to everybody who's worked on those. Uh, I'll keep my comments very brief. I think we know that there's, we're in a moment of real risk to the viability of uh, venues during, during COVID. And while I think TMAC took a huge step in rolling that rock up the hill to get the tax class established, which a retroactive program that has already seen nearly $2 million in relief going out to 50 venues, we know that that program on its own isn't a, a silver bullet. And we also know that we got a long time before we return to normal, let alone a new and better normal. And, and thus, all of these measures at each level of government, including ours at the city, around insurance and the venues need to be on the table. And so I, I won't speak much longer than that, because I know this has been a long conversation on this item, uh, except to say thank you to members of TMAC who worked over the last couple of weeks to prepare those motions. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'll look to move those as a package. So taking those all together. Uh, all those in favor, by way of a show of hands. Any opposed? All right, that carries. Um, this takes us to our, our final item, and I know we've, this has been going, this is a long meeting this time, uh, but this is the night economy update. Uh, Mike, uh, I believe you have an update for us, a brief presentation, uh, and we wanted to make sure that by virtue of this update we do get a, a music-specific subgroup feeding into this process. So Mike, why don't I turn it over to you to kick off the presentation. Uh, thanks, Joe. And, and yeah, I'll keep this very brief, keeping the clock in mind. We've been here for almost two hours now. so. Um, 
and, and you've heard way too much of me uh, already this afternoon. Um, as Joe said, this is really just so that you folks have an update on where we are with the night economy conversation uh, pre-COVID, where it was, what's happened since the pandemic struck, and, and where we're at, with the ideal that uh, TMAC will uh, start contributing some music-specific um, input into the night economy work. Um, next slide, please. So the basics, going back uh, in, in the summer of 2019, it feels like about a decade ago right now, um, but we adopted as a city, council adopted the Night Economy Action Plan. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson was appointed as the Night Economy Ambassador. Uh, there is a website up uh, at the City of Toronto together with some general objectives about planning, creating a strategic approach uh, with planning and policies, protecting, which is around safety and support, and creativity, which is uh, about creating vibrancy, supporting talented artists and entrepreneurs, et cetera. I should point out that when we talk about the night economy, just to reiterate, we're not just talking about music and hospitality and, and nightlife. Uh, we're certainly talking about those things, but we're also talking about, you know, shift workers, people who are, are uh, um, on their way to and from jobs uh, between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m., transit, lighting, infrastructure, safety. So all of the building blocks that are necessary to, to have a more fully fleshed out night economy than, than we do now. Um, two working groups have been formed. There's an internal group uh, with the divisions that you see there. They are all divisions that have either a policy or regulatory uh, touch point with the night economy. An external group, which includes uh, performing artists, live music venues, nightclub operators, DIY events, uh, a member of Toronto's youth cabinet, uh, harm reduction, sexual assault organizations, uh, Destination Toronto, um, Ontario Restaurant Hotel and Motel Association, the BIA's uh, nighttime trades and, and youth. And both those working groups have met uh, and, and they're starting to, to move ahead with the priorities. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, before COVID hit, there were public consultations planned for the first part of this year. Uh, we engaged an external consultant. There were going to be three so-called listening sessions to hear from the public on what they thought the priority should be for uh, amplifying the night economy, one in Scarborough, one in North York, one in Etobicoke. There was going to be a town hall at Canadian Music Week in May. Of course, all of that was blown out of the water uh, by, by COVID. The current plan is to uh, restart those consultations, but have them be done virtually beginning early next year, with, of course, an acknowledgement that, that COVID has impacted uh, not just the night economy, but, but every part of the economy, and certainly around recovery plans. Next slide, please. So some of the current priorities um, which the Night Economy Working Groups are moving ahead with this fall are, first of all, recovery, uh, mostly manifested through a few city programs under the umbrella of an initiative some of you are aware of, I think, called Show Love TO. That includes uh, sub programs like the Cafe TO, very successful bar and restaurant, curb lane program, Stroll TO, local TO, both of which are meant to generate local tourism, being as how we're not going to get people from other cities or other, other countries here, um, and transitioning slowly from the curbside patios of Cafe TO into something called winter patios, which is going to incorporate, you know, a more fully fleshed out sort of heaters and, and maybe uh, roofs and tents with sides to help uh, animate the streetscape as the weather gets a little colder. Um, Night Economy internal working groups also working on reviewing and updating standard city processes, trying to deal more quickly and flexibly with new challenges and opportunities. For example, the approval of the CAFE 2 activations, um, speeding up some of the ways in which the city deals with uh, and handles suggestions and ideas to respond to the challenges of the current moment. Um, there's a, a, a need to balance regulation with encouraging recovery and vibrancy. Toronto Public Health, as you've heard from Tara, is already uh, encountering that in, in you know, the balance between wanting to reopen the business sector with protecting public health. Um, municipal licensing and standards, I know Rose Burroughs is, is on the call, um, is seeing that with uh, vastly increased noise complaints through the summer, um, despite the need that many of us feel to encourage vibrancy and activity and, and any kind of, you know, gathering. A lot more people are home and 
people are, are sometimes stressed or anxious and they're in a position where they're, you know, hearing things that are maybe more bothered by things than they might have been otherwise. Um, so there's all these balances that, that need to be taken into consideration. Next slide, please. Um, DIY spaces remain very much in our focus, certainly with the music office and with economic development and culture in these conversations. TMEC members, you'll probably remember that before COVID, we were um, moving the ball down the field a little bit with um, finding city-owned spaces for interim DIY tenancy. Um, that hasn't gone away. Um, it's still very much uh, part of what we want to do, but in the interim, because of the urgencies of COVID, we're currently exploring whether or not existing spaces um, might be appealing and desirable to the DIY community. Um, we've we've had DIY event operators, some of them on TMAC, some of them not, take a look at a couple of different spaces. The idea being that if they're of interest, we might look at can the city support DIY event organizers going into these spaces uh, by helping defray some of the operational costs of going in and doing that. And the reason for this is that these spaces that we're now starting to look at they're already up to code. They're already built. They don't need um, millions of dollars of, of work to rehabilitate them so, so people can safely enter the way some of the unused or derelict city-owned spaces in, in, the, in the first idea might need. Um, we're also talking uh, in a very interesting way with our colleagues in the planning division and municipal licensing and standards and buildings and fire on the idea of pre-approving specific spaces for DIY events, um, places in, in different parts of the city that might be uh, already examined and inspected by the regulatory divisions. And they're able to say, okay, you know what, for a capacity of 75 people with curfews of X uh, and only so many events per month, you're good to go with this space. And that would really uh, do a lot to cut down on the timeline between, you know, how most DIY event organizers operate between conceiving an event and, and applying for permits and then actually wanting to, to do it. Uh, this is where, frankly, we could use some further TMAC input on where some of the um, cool emerging entertainment areas might be, whether it's, you know, Sterling Road, Vaughan Road, uh, the northwest part of the city, or elsewhere into Scarborough, North York, Etobicoke, would be very interested in recommendations. I know I've heard from some folks already on that, but uh, we could use we could use some more. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, coming to an end here, uh, there will be future work done. I know some of the folks involved uh, in operating um, live music venues are interested in this one. Um, municipal licensing and standards and planning are currently exploring their next steps in a joint review of licensing and zoning bylaws uh, around restaurants, uh, bars, and, and nightclubs. Um, Pre-COVID, uh, this was planned for 2020, uh, but now staff are re-examining this work to determine the best approach and the timing for resuming the review, given the fact that the landscape has changed somewhat. Uh, when the work is resumed, uh, municipal licensing and standards and planning staff will engage through through the music office. Uh, we'll make sure that we play a role in making sure that they're hearing from the right people, uh, as well as residents and, and other partners, to make sure that the issues are understood and and what the recommendations might be whether that be more flexibility with existing license categories or the creation of a new license that more accurately describes what a live music venue does we we shall see uh next slide uh the other thing that we're looking at um is something called an arts event permit um this this is in development. It's probably not going to be rolled out uh, very very soon. Uh, the internal working group uh, represented there that you see uh, the idea is an online system through which event organizers can apply and provide information about the space they want to use. Again, this is um, DIY events, nomadic uh, people who don't have access to a fixed bricks and mortar space. Um, there's a template uh, already at work in the city with the film permitting system through which location managers show up at the film office and they. Can get a permit to film in public space um, around the city uh, and the goals would be to, to streamline things uh, so we've got 
quicker approvals for event organizers, consistency and evaluation of proposals. I know we hear from a lot of DIY event organizers that it seems to be a little random uh, about uh, what, what gets asked for and what's get, what gets enforced. And finally, this would provide a really good source for information for city staff, for councillors, for the regulatory divisions, knowing what's going on in different parts of the city, as they do. They know exactly where filming is taking place uh, any time of the the day or night. Um, however, uh, as you can imagine, this takes resources and time uh, needed to plan and create this system um, and uh, a lot of IT work, I imagine, as well. So in the meantime, uh, we're going to be looking to TMAC for um, recommendations for emerging entertainment areas. I put that in quotation marks because that's part of the Nighttime Economy Action Plan um, and, and further uh, insights and, and information from all of your contacts on, on what would be relevant, useful, important, um, game-changing, revolutionary in trying to make sure that we um when when we are allowed to gather again and when things start creeping back that that we can do that in in a way that that reflects uh you know new realities and equal access to space and 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 permits and, and the like next slide please so uh again lastly uh your involvement here folks uh, should you should you choose to be would be to create a team a subgroup a red squadron whatever it may be um to provide ongoing information into the night economy working group um team X should be part of this conversation and and my my whole purpose in wanting to present this to you right now is to make sure that you have an update that we have uh some folks who might like step forward and identify themselves and say yeah, you know, I'd like to be part of that and to feed input from the music uh, community into the night economy discussions as they uh, as they develop. Um, finally, uh, and this is something that Marianne and I were talking about with with Joe. Our music strategy was created and passed uh, in 2016. Uh, even without COVID, it would be time to look at that and and update it to reflect the current circumstances um, with TMAC. Uh, sorry, with COVID. Um, even more so. So um, Mary Ann, I think, is going to help uh, cohere a group of people who might be interested in this. Um, I would very much like to be part of that conversation as well. And I think it's something that uh, we should move ahead with, uh, given that we're, you know, two years into uh, in, into this iteration of TMAC. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, at the end of that presentation, back over to you, Joe, if anybody's got any questions or, or comments here. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks, Mike. Uh, so we want to open it up. Part of part of the intention bringing this here is there's a lot of work happening in the city on the nighttime economy, and frankly, there's a concern that if we don't establish and get engaged with a music specific subgroup, that it could get a, it could get in front of us. Um, and so that was part of the impetus here is to get that going, as well as as Marianne, as Mike mentioned, Marianne's point about the need for us to to start working to update our strategy in the context of COVID. Um, do, so let me open it up. Any questions of Mike uh, or comments here to speak? Uh, I have Spencer down, then Sean. Um, Spencer, why don't you kick us off, and then I have Sean. Uh, sure. I just wanted to ask about the composition there are currently of the internal and external working groups. Um, I know despite my extensive work in the in this area, there was never anything that I was invited to participate uh, in. So, just curious about about you know who and what they represent is actually on those uh, on those groups. And then the second thing I wanted to ask was about uh, although this may be down the road a bit yet, but uh, about whether there will be uh, some venues have asked me about. Um, for licensing opportunities again in the future, there obviously have not been any uh, during COVID to date. But as venues face restrictions on the number of people, they're, um, they're they're curious about whether there will be any opportunities to to expand their hours again. That's all. Okay, thanks, uh, Spencer. I can first talk to you about the um, the working groups. Um, I believe I covered the. Um, the internal working group, it's, it's a lot of the city divisions that you would expect, um, you know, planning, MLS, um, transportation services, um, Toronto Public Health, police, fire, uh, buildings, 
uh, I may be I may be leaving somebody out, but um, that that's the essence of it. And and most of those are are and of course EDC uh, economic development and culture are involved with either the regulatory elements of of uh, the nighttime or or planning and 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 policy. As far as the external working group. Um, there were a lot of people um, who, who expressed an interest in, in being part of this. Ultimately, the decision came down to um, the, the uh, Night Economy ambassador um, and uh, some of the internal working group members as well. But, but uh, there are um, performing artists, there are harm reduction um, and sexual assault organizations, uh, live music venues, uh, the Ontario Restaurant Hotel Motel Association, uh, Toronto Youth Cabinet, uh, DIY events, Destination Toronto, uh, nightclubs, uh, Tabia, BIA, um, and uh, arts and culture, and the trades, nighttime trades. Uh, and that's, that's the, I haven't given you individual names, but those are the, those are the uh, constituencies that, that are represented on the group. I, I can speak with you a little bit more offline if you prefer. I, I can add that uh, myself and Lisa. Tracy, are you in there too? Or on the nighttime economy? Um, and uh, so we're representing venues there. Um, we've just got the ability to communicate um, with one another in that capacity about two weeks ago. So um, I forget what the system is called, but we were waiting on that. And that, that has arrived in an email. It's been a turbulent couple of weeks um so hoping to dig into that uh in the next uh couple of weeks and and, and certainly work on uh, that before the next uh nighttime economy meeting thanks for that sean uh and spencer uh anybody else who wanted to jump in on this marianne did you want to jump in in the context of revising and updating the music strategy writ large in the context of the nighttime economy and COVID? I can uh, talk to it a bit if my cat Rex doesn't completely interrupt me the entire time because he has been talking quite loudly. Um, it just when Mike and I were speaking, um, the music strategy took a, probably a good six months to put together, um, and um, um, and then it, it was passed by council. And while it may seem like you know we've done a lot. Uh, thanks to thanks to Councillor Cressy and and us getting some motions through council, um, the strategy document is important for city staff because it gives them a document that they can point to when we're not in session um, to to say that you know we have a mandate to pursue these areas. Um, because there's a strategy document that represents what the music um, the music stakeholders would like to see happen, and it's been approved by city council. So it gives them um, permission, if you will, to to go and pursue items that are within that strategy. So it is a very important document. The other thing for those of you who are new to TMAC, um, this iteration is you'll discover that while it says that we kind of exist in the same time frame as city council does that's not really true um and that probably um you know four to six months before the the municipal election happens it's very difficult for us to get anything done and we'll stop meeting so so we are on a shorter timeline than you think in terms of getting things done getting things approved for us to be able to have an ongoing impact so i think that um while we were in covid talking about updating the strategy and and speaking with stakeholders to get their input was difficult um we need to start planning now for how we can hit the ground running on that in 2021 so that we can update that strategy during 2021, get it passed through council so that as things for us wind down in 2022, the city staff has some direction um, and has some permission to continue pursuing the things that we want to see done. 
thanks for that, Marianne. If I could just jump in really quickly to underscore the importance of what Marianne said. Uh, that document, that new strategy, I cannot tell you guys how often I cite that and I put it into um, communication with other city divisions and that I'm asked sometimes, why are we doing, why, why are we supporting live music venues and not shoe stores? Well, we don't have a shoe store strategy. We have a live music venue store, we have a music strategy that cites the importance of supporting different parts of the ecosystem. It comes up again and again and again. Uh, it's not just some dry, dusty thing that sits on a shelf somewhere that nobody looks at. It, it's it's cited repeatedly. Um, and the other point I wanted to make, uh, Marianne's quite right. It took many months of work looking at best practices from around the world and, and tweaking things in a Toronto-centric way. Uh, she was integrally involved in that in the first iteration. I don't think, and Marianne, you can let me know offline what you think of this, I don't think it's going to need a complete revision and, and tossing out of everything that's there. It's more just tweaking, updating, keeping some things, bringing in some new elements. So it probably isn't as monumental a task as, as the first one was, but 100% but agree that, that it needs to get uh, underway sooner than later because, yeah, it'll be hard to get any kind of um, movement on a TMAC issue um, a few months into 2022. So the time is, is now. Thanks for that. Should I ask um, that you send a link out to that document, the last one? It'll give some people that are newer with uh, TMAC. Sure. You mean you um, haven't been sleeping with it under your pillow? Yeah, I've, I've got that dry, dusty one you were talking about. Yeah. yeah <laughs> somewhere. Um, but yeah, if you could send out a link to that just so people can familiarize themselves, and then and then it might make it a bit easier to have those task force. So there, Got could, it. One, there could be a venue one, there could be a record industry one, uh, et cetera, um, and, and maybe suggestions on tweaking what's there, as, like you said, as opposed to making a brand new document from scratch. Sure, will do. Thank you. Good suggestion. Uh, anybody else who wanted to speak on this item? All right, I'll, I'll jump in and I'll, I'll just... Quickly, the, the formality is to move the motions that that uh, Mike and Marianne have both spoken to. One is about ensuring that the nighttime economy work that's happening across sectors at the city takes into consideration the work of TMAC, and we'll look to, to Mike uh, following up with members of TMAC to establish that, that working group on it, which is re referenced here. And the second is as part of the November discussion to talk about the process for, for updating in the context of COVID and the nighttime economy, our music strategy writ large. Large, uh, and I know Marianne's going to facilitate and lead the discussion in November on that one. Uh, and so that I'll just place those and, and simply note that there's a tremendous part of the rationale on the nighttime economy here is that there's a tre tremendous amount of work happening at the city across divisions on this. And unless we put our foot forward uh, to ensure that live music is central and key to that, there's a risk that we not only miss an opportunity, but that in a sense we get left behind. And so I, I do think that's important, uh, as is the broader piece around uh, revising our work. Just as we talked about, you know, exploring issues related to affordable housing and basic income, in addition to supporting uh, venues and artists uh, earlier, I think increasingly post-COVID, those may become central to the strategy. So I think some of the conversation earlier will become a bigger part of this discussion going forward. Uh, that's just my two cents. So with that, we have those placed. So I'll just, by way of a show of hands, all those in favor, um, looking for any opposed, seeing none, that carries. So that concludes the formal piece of this, uh, of the, the meeting. So thanks for sticking with it. I know it was a rather long one. Um, um, I also just, before Mike, I'm going to come back to you, I see you have your hand there, but uh, we have a motion that TMAC excuse the absence of uh, five members who could not attend today. This is a formal process to excuse their absence. This is Councillors Bailao and, and Thompson, as well as Vivian, Jesse, um, Tona, John, and Kim. Um, so that is to excuse their absence. All those in favor? Opposed, if any, that carries. Mike, you wanted to jump in before we formally wrap? 
Yeah, just a couple of quick things. Thanks, Joe. Um, this was a message from, from Vivian. Just wanted to let people know that uh, she's been working very hard on, on the advance uh, initiative, as, as most of you know, uh, which is a industry group designed to promote a career trajectory for black professionals in the music industry. They're working on hiring an executive director right now. Uh, they would like industry support with some of the research that they're doing. They're working with Music Canada, CCMAs, and Women in Music Canada. Uh, Vivian encourages people to uh, go to their site at advancemusic.org and sign up as either a member or an ally, and also wants everybody to know that if anybody's looking to fill a job opening that you might have, as unlikely as that may seem right now, nonetheless, uh, with a black candidate, uh, please get in touch with uh, with her in advance, and, and they have a lot of candidates that would be um, very happy to, to, to put forward for consideration there. Uh, and just finally, I just wanted to point out that um, some of you uh, knew uh, Ryan Ayukawa, uh, journalist uh, and real passionate supporter of live music in Toronto. He sadly passed away last month. Um, I just found out about that today, and I just wanted to uh, express my condolences uh, here at this meeting with some folks who I know would have known Ryan as well. So here's to you, Ryan. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for that, Mike, and for sharing the, the news that some were aware of. Okay, well, listen, thank you, everybody. Uh, I know this was a long one um, and went in a lot of different directions, uh, and we will talk to you all soon uh, and look out for emails from, from Mike and myself shortly uh, on following up on a number of these pieces. Have a good day, folks. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you.